So I have kind of a strange question to kind of get our sermon started tonight. That if you were in charge of Disney World, is that would you open the park for, I don't know, like a dozen people or so? Would you go ahead and put in all that effort, all that energy, all that expense to go ahead and welcome and invite all to now come when 6 or 12 or, I don't know, 24 are going to show up? Are you going to send out the whole parade? Or, I don't know, maybe just a float or two. <laughs> Is it, are you going to go ahead and just finish it off that day with all of the fireworks or maybe just a few medium-sized ones and say, that's good enough? <laughs> I mean, in the broad scheme of things, that when so few would come, would you go ahead and put in all the expense, all the effort, all of that very work for so few? See, now I ask that question because in the midst of those handful of shepherds out there in the field, is that God somehow just manages to pour it all on. Is that sure enough, yes, only one angel shows up at first, telling and announcing to those shepherds of what has now happened. But by the end of that very announcement is that multitudes of shepherds, hundreds of shepherds, uh, shepherds, had hundreds of angels, yes, hundreds of shepherds showed up in the sky singing. <laughs> no, that, no, that would be very impressive. But hundreds of angels now singing the very first Christmas carol is that now God pours on all of that very joy all of that very effort, lighting the skies and indeed blowing their minds with this very hope that was now theirs. But the question that it just leaves me asking, of all of the places, why would he start there? And of all of the people, why would he start with them? I mean, in the broad scheme of things, when I start to think about all of that hope and all of that joy and all of this very message and news of Christmas, I might go ahead and start with some place, I don't know, maybe more populous, maybe some place more powerful, somewhere among other people who had more authority or influence or all sorts of things, but God chooses this lowly ragtag group of a handful of people to be the very first witnesses to hear that very word about his child that was born. Of all of the people, this is the one that now hear that very news, is that why would he choose those to now carry this very message as those who weren't even allowed to stand as eyewitnesses and give testimony legally in courts because others simply viewed them as shady. I mean, just think about that for a second. Why would he choose them? In a world that we find ourselves more and more confronted with those that would simply say that the Bible is filled with many good stories, many nice things, but many might question the very historical realities or the things that are written there, is that there comes this very word. That if somebody was going to make something up, don't you think they would pick some more reliable witnesses? Now, why does Luke tell that very fact that the shepherds are those who now hear that very first announcement? It's because they are the ones who truly did hear it. See, I noted, I, this was pointed out to me a number of years ago, is that in our reading from Luke chapter 2, that in four different verses, verse 1, verse 6, verse 13, and 15, is that there is a turn of phrase that especially in verse 1 is often just simply not even translated. Now, I thought the Bible, usually we wanted to go ahead and put all that in the Bible. But see, at the start, it begins with a phrase that somehow in English simply to us sounds redundant. So most modern translations just simply leave it out. 
It's that very phrase that said it came to be, or it might otherwise be translated, it happened this way. Four times, Luke comes and says it happened, it happened, it happened. He doesn't care how redundant it sounds or what he now says. Why? Because he now tells what truly happened on that first Christmas night. That we come here to hear that very word of truth and that very word of hope. But the question still can't help but bother me. (laughs) Why them? (laughs) Of all the people, of all the places, why them? Why not some priests or scribes? Then why not some kings or royalty? Why not some scholars or some soldiers or scores of common everyday folk out there ready to testify? Why not somewhere big and important? Why does he choose that little field with that little handful of people and these very shepherds? That in many ways were seen as outcasts, seen as nobodies, seen as those out there. In the midst. See, how many times have you been coming and hearing the Christmas story and you've probably thought, well, the shepherds just belong there. It's like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. See, that's how you hear it. But the fact is, is that they don't simply just go together. I mean, it's like Metallica opening for Taylor Swift. It just doesn't work. Or Dre opening up for Celine Dion. It just doesn't happen. You pick whatever is most sacrilegious to you. I don't know. (laughs) But it doesn't fit. Why would God choose them with this message? It's for that very fact that God's grace, it knows no bounds. God's grace reaches all the way down to the depths. That God's grace is one that comes to the weak, it comes to the lowly, it comes to the poor, it comes to the hurting and broken, and it comes to those who are struggling this Christmas. That God's grace comes to them. Why? It's not just simply that the angels didn't want to wake anybody else. I mean, the shepherds were up, let's just go ahead and get them. Said no. The shepherds were those who didn't earn it, they didn't deserve it, that they were those that God chose to show of how far he was willing to go and of just what it means to be a God who reveals himself to the outcast. Is that the shepherds working with animals were not only ceremonial, ceremonially unclean, but they were kept away for long periods of time from ever even coming to the temple or coming to God or coming to receive the cleansing that they needed, that they were far off. But God drew near to them. That I don't know, maybe it's also that very fact that maybe they above everyone else, when God comes and says that the Christ child, the Messiah, the Lord is born, is that you'll find him in a stable laying in a manger. Maybe also these shepherds were the only others that wouldn't laugh at that idea that we simply so often just take for granted. No, God comes in this Christmas story coming, breaking through, and rattling and shaking our cages to try to get us to understand, but we think it's so normal. See, over the years, I've had to stop and think, how do I get that Christmas message across? How do I get that gospel of what God has done across? I mean, I've cut down Christmas trees. I've climbed 25-foot ladders that I've presented meaningful and motivating movies. I've told jokes, as I've told loud and boisterous sermons, trying to get it across. I've tried to come across that still and quiet and reflective reality. And I've tried it all. But the fact is that's maybe the problem. 
See, I've tried in so many ways to somehow pep it up, move it on, rather than focus in. What is the Christmas gospel for you today? What is the very Christmas message that we come to hear? That on an ordinary night, to ordinary people, dealing with ordinary animals, an extraordinary God steps in. To the common, low and weak and mild, the very good news of a Savior born for all now comes. That a God who was rich beyond measure and lays it aside so that he might become poor, so that we may become rich, that is that very news. That today, today he wants to come and know you. Today he wants you to know that very news and like the shepherds, leave and go with that very life-changing world ahead. Sure enough, those shepherds went back to their work, they went back to their life, they went back to the way things were, but they were changed people changed by the news of one who came. The extraordinary God who comes into the ordinary reality. One who could take several ordinary pieces of wood and several ordinary nails and turn it into our very salvation. Who went to that cross and died that death that we deserve. See, I've always wished that I had that kind of ability to turn a phrase just right. Max Lucado does a much better job than I. He put it this way once, that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And Christmas commemorates the day and the way that God saved us from ourselves. See, the angels were quite happy and comfortable in the darkness of the night. And yet, when that glorious light came, that they found themselves afraid. When that light of God's glory and holiness steps into our life, we recognize that very darkness of sin. That our human heart is one that needs healing. And that is why he has come. And so may that very message of a God who would go to any length, to any person, to any very place, so that we may be changed, so that we may be freed, so that we may be able to enjoy the peace of God that that surpasses understanding, that guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful night that you have granted to us, and we thank you for family and friends and all of the very things of this holiday. We thank you for the food, we thank you for the presents, but help us to never forget that this is that very birthday of your Son, that help us in all things to realize the greater gift that he chooses to give us, even on this day that he deserves all honor, is that he is the one who desires to give it all away. Help us to celebrate that gift that is ours because of him. Amen.